Well, that got us started again. The chairman completely not answering a question. It is timely, and it's frankly not up to his discretion, but again, again, we've not really cared about that from the start to begin with. So um, my question is, is just schedule the hearing, but undoubtedly that's not what they want out there. So let's start over. Now that the chairman is recognized and we've got that point. You know, there have been famous moments in impeachment. There have been famous moments in impeachment as we've gone forward. There are famous lines from Nixon like, what did the president know and when did he know it? From the Clinton impeachment, there was, I did not have sex with that woman. What would be known about this one is probably, where's the impeachable offense? Why are we here? I tell you, this may be, though, become known as the focus group impeachment. Because we don't have a crime, we don't have anything we can actually pin, and nobody understands really what the majority is trying to do, except that interfere and basically make sure that they believe the president can't win next year if he's impeached. The focus group impeachment takes words and then takes them to people and say, how can we explain this better? Because we don't have the facts to match it. A focus group impeachment says, you know, we really aren't working with good facts, but we need a good PR move. That's why we're here today. This is, this is all about, as I said last week, a clock and a calendar. And it really became evident to me that this was true because last Wednesday, after we had a long day of hearing here, the next morning, before anything else could get started, the Speaker of the House walked up to the podium and said, go write articles of impeachment. She just quit. She just stopped. Go write articles of impeachment. I appreciate that the majority practiced for two days this weekend on this hearing. I appreciate that the fact that you've got to try and get it right to try and convince the American people of your problem, but your speaker's already undercut you. She took the, the, the thrill out of the room. You're writing articles of impeachment. Why couldn't we just save that time today, and if you're going to write the articles of impeachment, go ahead and write them? Well, there's probably a reason for that. Because the chairman laid out some amazing claims, none of which I think after this hearing today, the American people can honestly look at and see that there is overwhelming evidence, there is a proper reason he abused this power, because as the speaker, another statement she said, that to do impeachment you have to be so compelling and overwhelming and bipartisan all of which we are not. So why not? Why are we here? Well, I think we can do this. Let's look at, let's look at the three things that typically are associated with making your case or a crime. Let's do it against what the majority has said. I think they have motive, they have means, and they have opportunity. What's their motive? It's November 2020. It's been said over and over and over again. The chairman said it again this morning. It's been said all along that we have to do this because if we don't impeach him, he'll win again next year. The reason is shown as clearly as last week on the jobs report in the economy. And as I had a, a man come up to me in the grocery store this weekend, he said, keep doing what you're doing. He said, I've never seen an economy this good. He said, Our, he said people are working, people are being taken care of, and this is just a fatal distraction on a president that they don't like. Motive is easy. November 2016, they lost. January 2017, just a few minutes in, the Washington Post confirmed what every Democrat had been talking about. Now's the time for impeachment. We see tweet after tweet saying, now let's get at it. It's amazing that they start with impeachment and then they spent two years trying to figure out what do we impeach him on? Well, the means became what we see now. The means is, is to always talk about impeachment, to always say this president's doing something wrong, to say he is illegitimate, as the chairman has said before, that he's not even illeg a legitimate president is to constantly tear down at a president who is working on behalf of the American people. The sham impeachment, when we go through this, I think the chairman said something that was interesting. He said that a president should not be above the law and should be held accountable for the oath of their office. I think Congress ought to be held accountable for their oath of office as well and not to do what we're doing right now, and that is run a process that doesn't fit fairness or decorum, to run a process and a fact pattern that you're having to force against a president you don't like. But what was the opportunity? The opportunity came last November when they got the majority and they began their impeachment run. They began in the process, even uh, as they're selecting the chairman, the chairman said that I would be the best person for impeachment. This is November of last year. Before we had any hearings, before we had even were sworn in to this Congress, for anyone, the media or watching on TV or watching in this room, for anyone to think that this was not a baked deal is not being honest with themselves. You see, presumption has now become the standard instead of proof. 
It should cause anyone to begin to question because the entire case is built on a presumption, or as we found out last week from three scholars, that inference is okay. If you just infer that that's what they mean, then we'll take that. That was an interesting line. You know, it was interesting. They made their whole case built on Gordon Sondland. You're going to see that a lot today. He testified that he presumed that the aide was connected to an investigation, but he said nobody ever told him that. When Sondland even asked the president directly, he said, what do you want with the president? I want nothing. I want Zelensky to do what he ran on. Ukraine did nothing and got the aid anyway. But you know how I know that this is also a problematic experience? Just look over the past three weeks. When the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, who, by the way, is absent today, I guess he can't back up his own report, but he started his own hearing by making up the factual call. When he made it up, he started the fairy tale that we're having today. If you can't even put the transcript in the right context, just read it. Chairman Schiff couldn't even read the transcript. He had to make it up because if he didn't make it up, it didn't sound as bad. It didn't sound as bad. He said, listen, he said, let's make up some dirt. That's not what was said. The transcript, the chairman misled the American people as an attorney, as a chairman, as a member of Congress who swore an oath to tell, the, basically to be honest with the American people and to uphold the Constitution. That was such a massive malpractice I've never seen. Because you know why? Again, they don't care about what actually was in the transcript. They don't actually care what happened. And we heard last week from witnesses, they don't even care that the aid was released. They're simply looking at the facts to make it fit their narrative. But what else happened? You know, this is also the Chairman Schiff who also said that he had seen collusion in plain sight. That it was already there before the Mueller report ever came out, that all of this was going to happen. But you know, I guess maybe I might need to just not stop uh, commenting on Chairman Schiff and his guidance because I may end up on the next uh, phone records subpoena as we go forward. You see, we've taken a dangerous turn in this Congress. Subpoenas are fine, properly done, and should be done properly, but they should never be at the expense of a political and vendetta. Professor Turley testified last week, presumption is no substitute for proof. The current legal case for impeachment is not just woefully inadequate, but in some respects dangerous and the basis for impeachment of an American president. Today, what we were supposed to get was like what I'm, I love my friends on the, on the majority of this uh, committee said, Mueller. When we got the Mueller report, it didn't go real well. So we had a lot of hearings, didn't go real well. Then we finally got Bob Mueller, and they said, this is going to be the movie version. In fact, what happened, they did, uh, my colleagues on the majority had uh, live readings from Capitol Hill. They made dramatic podcasts. They even wrote a comic book rendition that breathed life into the Mueller report. And it didn't work. So they brought Bob Mueller. This was the movie version. They told us Robert Mueller's testimony would be the thing that people watched and would be convinced. Guess what? They wasn't convinced. In fact, it fell flat. But you know, today, I guess, is the movie version of the Schiff Report. Except one thing, the star witness failed to show up. Mr. Nunez is here. His staff is here. The leading headline is there, Schiff Report. But where's Mr. Schiff? And Mueller, Robert Mueller testified. The Ken Starr Report, Ken Starr testified. The author of the Schiff Report is not here. Instead, he's sending his staff to do his job for him. I guess that's what you get when you're making up impeachment as you go. So as we look forward here, there's going to be plenty of time to discuss the factual case for this and the statements that are not being made. What is very detrimental to me, though, is this. This committee is not hearing from a factual witness. This committee is not doing anything past hearing from law school professors and staff. We've not been given, the, pre the chairman said something about the president not being able to come. Show me where he would actually have a proper process in this that's not talking to staff and not talking to law school professors. When we could actually have witnesses that would be called by both sides. But I want to say this in the ending. I love this institution. I was here as a 19-year-old kid, as an intern, almost 32 years ago. This institution as we see it today is in danger. We see chairmen who are issuing subpoenas for personal vendettas. We see committees such as the Judiciary Committee that has held many, many substantive hearings has been the very center point of impeachment being used as a rubber stamp because we get not our marching orders from this committee and what it should be doing, but from the Speaker and the Intelligence Committee chairman. We're not able to do what we need to do because we're a rubber stamp. 
I love this institution, but in the last three days, I've, over the last few or four, three or four days, I've seen stuff that just bother me to no end and should bother everyone. The Speaker of the House, after hearing one day of testimony in the Judiciary Committee, said go write articles. Facts be damned. Al Green, another member of the House Majority, said we can keep impeaching him over and over and over and over again. Adam Schiff, when he told us he wasn't going to come, instead hide behind his staff, he also told us that we're going to keep investigating because they know this is going nowhere in the Senate and they're desperate to have an impeachment vote on this president. The economy is good, job creation is up, military is strong, our country is safe. And the Judiciary Committee has been relegated to this. Why? Because they have the means, they have the motive, and they have the opportunity. And at the end of the day, all this is about is about a clock and a calendar because they can't get over the fact Donald Trump is president of the United States and they don't have a candidate that they think can beat him. It's all political. And as we have talked about before, this is a show. Unfortunately, today, the witness who is supposed to be the star witness chose to take a pass and let a staff answer for him. With that, I yield back.